achieving inclusive and equitable, equitable growth while tackling the root causes of poverty. And all these things I'm mentioning here, they are articulated in all the documents that I have referred before. So what remains for us now is just to follow that and to implement. Furthermore, as a member of the African Union, Namibia is part to the AU strategy and long-term vision of creation of an African economic community as entrenched in the Abuja Treaty of 1991. The comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Program of CADP is the framework for Africa agricultural contribution towards the as aspiration of the African Economic Community by 2025. So we are just not talking about the multilateral outside the continent, but we have also to look at the continental programs. And that is why we are looking at programs like the programs of NEPAD, and the African Union has also developed a program through the homegrown school feeding programs. Recently, we have seen one of the schools in Namibia that has already started this program. And we want to see these programs in many of our schools in order for us really to contribute to the food security. The Malabo Declaration was very clear for us to end the hunger by 2025. 25 is very close. And maybe that's why you see me trying to be in a hurry, because we made that commitment, and that is the time for us to make sure that what has been decided at the level of heads of states is implemented. It cannot be implemented in the vacuum. It must be implemented at the level of member states. And each and every country has a responsibility. So therefore, Namibia has to play a role. When you perform well at the country level, you are performing well at the sub-regional level, and you are also making your contribution to the realization of Africa Agenda 2063. In conclusion, Namibia is taking steps to promote dialogue with a view to develop its strategy for attaining the zero hunger challenge posed by both the Sustainable Development Goals as well as the Malabo Declaration, and also to take an advantage of an opportunity, opportunities inherited into the AU continental framework. These are the issues that we have to look into very seriously in order for us to achieve our objectives. I therefore conclude by saying, I have been marketing Namibia over the years as a Minister of International Relations. I have been shaping the international agenda to address the real issues affecting the lives of the people. And these are the issues that are articulated in different international documents. Be it at the UN level, be it at the AU level, be it at the SADC level. And Namibia has been a very active member in the development of these institutions or these instruments. And now that they are agreed, this is the time for us to bring these instruments home and to be implemented. So therefore, I underline your excellencies, heads of international organization, this time around, my monitoring on the ground is going to be real. Namibian people must feel the impact of our foreign policy. 
They can only feel the impact of our foreign policy when it gets to them on the ground. And we are talking about ensuring food security from the rural area, small scale, up to the large areas. Of course, we have more qualified panelists who are working in the field, but as a coordinator for our foreign policy, I felt I have to share this and to tell you that Mirko should not only be seen as a ministry to be there outside. We must deliver what we got from outside to be felt in Namibia. I thank you. Let me thank the Honorable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for your motivational and forward-looking welcoming remarks. Let us give a once more hand of applause. <laughs> Let me now call upon our first panelist, the Honorable Minister of uh, Agriculture, Water and Land Reform, Honorable Master uh, Kale Sledwine. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Pendandanda, the Director of Salonis, Honorable Minister Nitumbun Daitwa, the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister of Mirko, fellow, ladies and gentlemen. I also want to recognize uh, Jane Guliras, you know, the the carrier of the flame and the legacy of my mentor, that is from the Teo Ben Gurirap. I'm very happy to see you here. It's very appropriate that I'll be participating in the 10th lecture here, and I'm very happy for being invited from it. Thank you very much for that opportunity. Now, when we discuss food security, and, and multilateralism, one has to realize that that is a very wide topic that has um, extremely complex and intertwined systems, institutions behind it. And I must apologize up front that I will not be able to tackle all of them. But I will try to touch on some of them in a, in a broad manner, and then we can discuss how we um, tackle other topics and um, related things. So it, it's, it's, it's a very apt topic, but it's a very complicated one. And I want to start with a quote from a very well-known historian, that is Yuval Noah Harari, in his book, Homo Dois, where he said, famine, plague, and war were always at the top of the list. For generation after generation, humans have prayed to every god, angel, and saint, and have invented countless tools, institutions, and social systems to address it. But they have continued to die in their millions from starvation, epidemics, and violence. So what has captured mankind ever since is still here. We, 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 should not, we should not blind ourselves that we have escaped the trilogy of challenges that we have to continuously address. And let's look at it. You know, we thought sometimes that technology has solved our problems. We don't have to be producing our food. We can buy it somewhere else. Health is a technological problem. We have medicines, vaccines. Not a pr big problem anymore. We are done. And because of those two main things, there's also no need for war. There's no need to fight over food, over um, economic chances. It's all peaceful and we can do it. 
But then came COVID. And in one rather unfortunate observation, we must realize that we are still not in control of disease. The reaction of national entities towards that disease was to revert back to nationalism, to protectionism, to threaten multilateralism. And that has its consequences on a policy of food security. In fact, we are reverting back to what um, is not always for the better, but it is now very necessary, that is to food self-sufficiency rather than food security, which could have been a shared um, solution were it not for the threat towards multilateralism. As I said, the topic is wide, and there are a number of aspects. And the first aspect I want to look at is what, what is it that entails food security? What is it that we mean when we talk about food security? Honorable Deputy Prime Minister mentioned one very important point. Food security is not always nutritional security. And the, and the examples are, are ample. We can go to our own informal settlements or the Rio de Janeiro flavelas or the squatter settlements in Nairobi. There is hunger, but there is no starvation. What is there is serious nutritional uh, shortage, but people don't die. So you can survive, but you are in a food insecure um, situation. So there is a subtle difference between what is nutritional uh, security and food security. In any case, you know, if you, if you look at, at where our systems go, um, in the poorer you, you are, the, the worse is your nutritional security. And the richer you are, of course, the better is your nutritional um, security because you have choices and the means. To, to get what you believe um, is, is healthy. But food security also, well, it, it entails much more than the production and availability of food from own sources. In any case, I, I, I believe that when Harari says it has been the most important challenge for mankind or humans ever since. I want to go a step further and say, well, it, 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 it has been scientifically shown that it is, in fact, one of the very important drivers of evolution of any organism to satisfy the energy needs or food requirements of organisms has been probably one of the most important drivers of evolution and we haven't we haven't escaped it 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 is there and it will be there for for a number of for, well for always but there's one big difference and that is that we as humans have managed through brain power to think beyond what evolution is driving us at we have science and technology. We can provide solutions outside the evolutionary framework that will, that will help us to capture the challenge. And I think multilateralism and in, in food security requires that the globe is not restrictive 
in giving access to technological and scientific solutions. We cannot sit in a small country and say, we are good enough, our brain power is big enough to solve all the solutions. It would be extremely wasteful if we ignore the brain power of the whole world, if we ignore and if we create systems that shields some countries from the brain power, the intellectual property, the, te the technology that is available, the means to produce through technology, um, to produce food and create food secure systems of the world. So we must open up. It is, it is not a question to what extent, it is, in my opinion, a necessity to open up completely so that all the solutions are available to all systems, to all institutions, to bring about food security. Science and technology is not a threat to religion, is, is not in competition with religion. It is the ability that we have acquired through our brain power to solve our problems, sometimes a little bit better than just praying. And I think that is, that is a an, 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 an pivotal point that underwrites the necessity for multilateralism. Open up, share what we have. The second aspect, the Deputy Minister, uh, Prime Minister, is urbanization. We in Namibia have Vision 2030. We say in nine years, we will be an industrialized nation. Now, implicit in that means that probably 60% of our populations will be living in towns, cities. The world, I think, is estimated to have 80% of its population living in large cities. That means not everyone can have a garden and produce his or own, own food. It puts a challenge towards self-sufficiency self of food for all. We are moving away from systems where everyone is doing everything. Urbanization has forced us into a division of labor system where very few, proportionally, in the world will produce food and very many will be relying on the system to get food while they are involved in other production lines that, that make life in urban cities possible. To embrace that in Namibia, we have to move away from the very inefficient extensive farming practices that we have. Where we sit and we see our cattle move in the field and then we count them when they come back. And we eat some of them and we slaughter the soap surplus and create wealth. But that, that is a highly inefficient way which is not good enough anymore because farmers must now embrace the responsibility to produce food at nutritional values, uh, standards, and health standards that is fit for everyone. And there is competition for space. So we have to embrace intensifying agriculture. We have to embrace diversifying agriculture. You must be ready as a farmer to do more than one farming practice on your piece of land. And you must be engaging in intensive farming. We must also engage in urban agriculture, in urban food production, the huge potential. I went to China and I saw an eight-story building, which was a piggery. So these, well, 
poor animals, or sometimes, I don't know whether one can talk about happy animals, they were living in an eight-story building where all the processes from breeding to slaughtering and processing were housed. That's urban agriculture. And it happened in a, in a city, not, not on a farm, in town. So urban agriculture, and it includes hydroponics and a whole host of intensive farming practices that produce um, food. For Deputy Prime Minister, it, it also um, preempts that we look, when we talk about food security and food self-sufficiency, that we look beyond farming. We must look beyond the producing of raw materials that are edible. We must actually develop value chains that are producing food. And that is value chains that include both the input and the output side. But in a country where we are very few and very dry, which is characterized by inequality, which is characterized by consumption patterns that show that we consume what we don't produce and we produce what we don't consume, it requires that on the one hand we must improve our ability to engage in value chains and produce more of what we consume. But at the same time, it puts as a requirement that we open up our markets so that we have access to other markets where we sell surplus and have the ability to acquire what we don't produce ourselves because it's too expensive, because our climatical conditions do not allow that to, to produce. So multilateralism in terms of trade, in terms of finance, in terms of health, in terms of intellectual property, in terms of well, food production itself, like the FO, is, is an absolute necessity for a successful modern economy to, to exist and thrive. We cannot anymore sit back and say what we produce is good enough to sustain the, the, the needs of the population. We may have enough food, but it may be very expensive to produce. So our possibilities to create wealth will be diminished by the fact that we have to spend more and more energy and resources to acquire food. And measure of wealth is actually the opposite. The less you spend on food and necessity, the wealthier and the more prosperous you are. So again, vitalism is is in our case a, a absolute must, and that includes all these aspects that I have mentioned. There's one, of course, that, that we often forget, forget that that is the, the logistics component. If you are not eating what you produce on your farm, you need to transport it, you need to store it, you need to conserve it, you need to do a number of steps in the value chain that allows you to share it with those that don't don't produce, and the logistic effort is, is an enormous one. The third aspect that I wanted to touch on um, food security is, of course, the environmental aspects. Agriculture, as in practice, is known to be one of the most significant destroyers and destructors of habitat. Agricultural practices had a very, very significant impact on environmental degradation and on climate change. The world's patterns, how we consume food, is extremely unequal. In the rich countries, Hunger is not a problem, but overeating is. More people die of obesity than from starvation. We, in a, in a skew economy, have a little bit of both. 
we have a small portion of the population that lives in very opulent lifestyle while others struggle in poverty. And it has its environmental degradative impact. And I believe here, again, multilateral rulemaking, multilateral governance is very much required to bring everyone back to more sustainable, more environmentally um, friendly practices. Food security does not mean that every citizen must have caviar, asparagus, and wine every second meal. It does not mean that. Although it is nice, but it does not mean that. And I think the, the wealthy as well must cut back on their opulent lifestyles to make a sustainable and, and um, yeah, well, sustainable is the right word, for the world to move more closer to a food secure system. Our consumptive patterns are, are really um, overstretching the ability of the globe to produce enough food that we can in the long term say we are food secure and we will remain food secure for, 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 for the future. And we will not burden our, our next generations with, with really almost insurmountable problems that may occur if we continue with, with these opulent tendencies. I know we will want to discuss later and therefore I want to conclude now. There are many other topics that we can, that we can discuss. My last point is that, and I've touched on it in the beginning, is that we, we unfortunately see that um, this mantra of might is right is increasing in its um, re-emergence. And we see serious threats towards multilateral institutions, multilateral governance. Protectionism is coming back, markets are closed, and some of the, the, the governance issues, like financial means, like trade and openness of trade, are kind of weaponized and used not to punish those that are not participating in the multilateral organizations, but the opposite. It is punishing those that are not furthering the interest of an individual entity, whatever country it is. And that is extremely dangerous, and that is why I think the, the, the Honorable Deputy Prime Minister is absolutely right. Foreign policy is touching everybody. Foreign policy must look, what do we do in agriculture? How do we participate in food production? How do we participate in food self-security? How do we participate in the whole value chain of food production? But the opposite is also true. Agriculture must participate in foreign policy. So I would like to participate in the same vein as you do in my projects. Maybe not in all embassies, but I'm happy that you, that you take agriculture as an aspect that can and must influence foreign policy. I think it is absolutely crucial. It would be a mistake if our very subsidies, that is, energy requirements, are not forming an important part of foreign policy. So I'm, I'm very happy that that is, is the, the drive of it. And I want to close with a quote from Colonel Theo Ben Gurirap which I picked up in his bibliographic notes when he went, when he, when he became the president of the National Assembly. He said, what initially we did not realize ourselves was that by this arrangement, it was possible to bring together at one place the future leaders of Namibia from all parts of the country. And with your permission, Jane, I have paraphrased it and I hope he is happy with that, and I'm sure he is. 
And now it reads, what we have to realize ourselves is that by this arrangement that is multilateralism, it is possible to bring together at one place the future leaders of the world from all places of the globe. Tilban Gingrap was a very convinced multilateralism propagator. He was a world citizen. He led the National Assembly and I I am convinced that he would be happy with this debate, that he would be very satisfied with um, having paraphrased his, his quote that was talking about the, the, the very necessity to go beyond tribalism, to go beyond um, personal interest and bring together all the leaders of the country at that time to make it possible that we will be liberated and that we talk with one voice to, to that liberation. And that is true for the globe as well. Our problems are global problems that must attract global solutions. I think that has been very much realized. And therefore, just to repeat myself, I think it is, it is crucial that as a small, skew economy, if we want to thrive, we must be inclusive instead of exclusive. We must share and cooperate instead of trying to go with ourselves. We must avoid actually um, do away with any xenophobic feelings. When you are xenophobic, you are depriving yourself of brain power that could help you. We must be inclusive. We need the global brain power. We have not enough of it ourselves. We are the people, we are the country of the brave. We have few people, all of us are good people. We are not stupid, we are actually very um, endowed with brain power. But we have not enough of it ourselves. There is a whole globe that contributes can contribute to our, our problem and our solutions. So with that, Mr. Deputy Minister, I um, look forward to the questions and answers and say thank you for listening. <laughs>
not just WFP but also other UN agencies that are here and those who are not here, I can be allowed a few minutes to speak on their behalf. We are committed to ensuring that uh, uh, food security is tied to nutrition security also. That is an end-to-end -end process that looks at how the seed goes onto the ground or uh, livestock. Uh, the research that goes behind that to make sure there is a more efficient input that goes in until the end, as Your Excellency said, the quality of the produce that goes onto the table in terms of the diet that people consume to avoid issues like obesity uh, while also addressing issues about uh, food insecurity. Uh, the other area that we've seen when we try to break down the guidance, the instruments that we have both at multilateral level and the programs from the Minister of Agriculture is also uh, using evidence to ensure that we know what is the life-changing programs and what do they bring on board so that when you go to work with the community and you come out proud that I've changed people's lives, how do you know that? So uh, collecting evidence of, you know, how do you ensure there's a proper baseline to know that last year this community was able to consume a very healthy diet every day for the whole year consistently without illness and has that improved this year. So um, what we are so happy also from our development partners, we got a lot of support uh, to be included and involved in the cost of hunger study, COHA, which is a study that is undertaken to understand how expensive is the diet in Namibia and how less are we doing to afford that. So it's a study that is ongoing and I will give a chance to my colleagues at some point who are involved because this, uh, this involves different agencies. It also involves the African Union uh, as well as the uh, other organizations across the world. So collecting evidence, ensuring that we measure the vulnerability is something that we are keen to uh, understand in order for us, uh, Your Excellency, to show that there is improvement on the ground. Uh, so the fact that programs need to be prioritized uh, to bring in the efficiency uh, to show that we move away from um, kind of business as usual to showcase that, okay, uh, there's an investment that has come in from um, a partner in the multilateral engagement and that investment has value that it shows. Um, the second thing that, again, um, as I have repeatedly said, and I, uh, Your Excellency, when I visited your office, uh, I said how I was impressed that once I, when I arrived in Namibia and went around the regions in October last year, I was impressed by how the women and the youth are the ones that are really pushing uh, provision of food into their households. Uh, when you talk to some of these women, these women used to be the you know, the cashiers in a big supermarket, they lost their job, a guy used to, youth used to be a taxi driver, and now they're involved in, in, in growing food and keeping chicken. So the addressing the inequality, gender inequality, gives, gives, it, gives it even more value, seeing that the women and the youth are already showcasing that they can bring solutions to uh, Namibia. Last week we were again with my colleague Farai from FAO. We were in Ohangwena and Kunene and also in uh, Ochevirongo. And all these locations, if I can give one example in Opuo. Opuo is undergoing very serious drought and I think this is chronic. Um, but there's these two women in their late 60s, 70s in the middle of the town using a little basin area near the you know, seasonal river. That's the only green place in the whole of Opuo. And these are women who uh, I remember when we were there, Farai, if you can remember, we were trying to catch up with the speed of them walking because we asking them, so how big is your land? And they said, come, follow us. 
army started sweating because they were moving faster than the speed of most of us even 20 years ago. Uh, so the energy that this was displayed is to show that there is uh, a powerful force in the community that can fast track the problems you are facing, even to address drought. So if we can replicate what these women are doing, they are doing diversified agriculture, they are doing intercropping, and they're in the middle of nowhere where they can get proper help. So I think uh, addressing that, we have been having a discussion with the regional governor of uh, Konene uh, to support their program because that, that project can be linked to the schools which need supplements, supplement, supplementary feeding. So that's a way that you can have, apart from the South-South Corporation, community to community engagement and, and, and collecting value from each other. Um, the other thing that, again, the multilateralism brings to me is, and, and this is again what um, Honorable Kyle mentioned about food systems, that not everybody is producing, but everybody is part of that food that goes to the table. So uh, back again to what Excellency mentioned about the uh, organizing the food systems dialogue in Namibia, this will be some uh, engagement that within the UN agencies we have started to have that engagement to look at food security, food and nutrition security through a food systems lens where even as an agency that deals with food and nutrition, when you are addressing issues in the field, you bring along other partners. But in this case also, the importance of private sector comes in because there's so much value in the private sector that we can build on because most of the time private sector wants to make money, right? But also they bring efficiencies that we don't find in other uh, normal businesses. So we just have to make sure there's a good balance to ensure there is a safety net built to protect especially smallholder farmers from any disadvantages they get from the engagement with the, with the bigger private sector. But I think we have seen in the, in the recent discussion, the high level meeting we had in December in this hall, we saw the engagement between private sector and organizations like WPFAO, UNICEF, um, uh, UNHCR, UNDP, there was a lot of engagement around how can the private sector bring value to your programs. And there's a lot now that is going on in the programs that are rolling on. And this brings also the, the issue that uh, Your Excellency mentioned around social protection, because social protection includes things around uh, digital solutions. How do we make sure that a social protection program by government does not have people uh, benefiting from the social protection program for the rest of their life when that vulnerability that it addresses is no longer there in the family. Uh, for example, you have people who benefit, say, from child grant. Child grant, I don't know what's the age limit, but then maybe these children, if you go into the records, they have never grown, so somebody continues to benefit from a child grant for 30 years. So these are things that, again, we can engage private sector to bring in value. But I think, uh, uh, most of ceremony, maybe I can pause here and allow one or two inputs from my colleague in FAO, now that I mentioned her name, I love food systems, and then uh, maybe Elvis, if you are there, to, about the cost of hunger study that we are doing, just two, two minutes, if you are allowed. Yeah? If you are allowed. Okay. Okay, over to you, Farai. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity, um, Honorable Deputy Prime Minister and the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Water and Land Reform, as well as my colleague George, Madam Guriras, and all the esteemed members in the audience. I just want to make perhaps uh, not, not so much a question, but just to contribute to the subject on the table. I think it's important as we discuss the topic of uh, multilateralism and food security 
to recognize that there is a lot of interconnectedness. And there is, uh, for example, interconnectedness in terms of the natural systems that form the basis of the agriculture systems as well as contributing to food security. So for example, you have biomes that, that extend beyond the borders of Namibia, going into other neighboring countries. And therefore, the issues that pertain to the management of those biomes, they impact on all the countries that are part of the biomes. So as we think of food security, therefore, we need to, to think also of what is happening in the neighboring country and also to coordinate, share information, and was mentioned earlier, technology as well as uh, learning across those countries that share the same natural resources that are the basis of the, of the food system. And then the other issue that I also want to highlight is the issue of pests and diseases. For example, we have a lot of pests that are of a transboundary nature that impact on the agriculture and food security space. Currently, we have the issue of the locusts that are impacting not just Namibia, but they are impacting Angola, Zambia, Botswana, South Africa, as well as Zimbabwe. So we need to come together at the table across as regional blocks, but even beyond that, as global blocks or continental blocks, because locusts are also impacting the Horn of Africa. So there are lessons to be learned, there are good practices to be shared across the different countries. And uh, I would also just like to make the, the point that I think we also need to move beyond the rhetoric of multilateralism and really put ourselves to task because our systems are under severe threat. And if we continue along this path, as we can clearly see through the outbreak of pests that affect plants and animals, but also people, COVID-19 is, is uh, postulated to have started as a result of, as Honorable Schlettwein mentioned, of us encroaching into the natural space and the, dis the, the disease jumping from animals to humans. So we really need to move beyond the rhetoric and put ourselves to task in terms of what do we need to do concretely, not just nationally, but across nations. So finally, I would just like to say that there is more that unites us across countries, even across continents, than that separates us. And therefore, we need to work together. Division is a, is a contrived construct that we can work to destroy and to focus on working across borders, across countries, within continents, and even at global level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Master of Ceremonies, uh, Honorable Deputy Prime Minister, Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Your Excellencies. Uh, just a very quick, um, um, uh, as requested by Dr. Feather, uh, I'll talk about two key studies that are ongoing in Namibia that have a direct effect on um, food and nutrition security, but more importantly provide a very um, significant and strong platform to advocate for uh, policy change and strategy within food and nutrition security. The first study is called the COHA. It's the cost of hunger in Africa. Um, a, um, a concept that was borrowed from, uh, from South America. And essentially, it, it highlights the cost of inaction, the cost of not addressing food and nutrition security or hunger at its infancy. And the consequences of the inaction is quite not only gross but high for most African countries. The study therefore highlights what governments spend when they do not address hunger or address nutrition at its infancy. Some of the consequences of such inaction include stunting among his children. And stunting, as you all know, is an irreversible consequence for such children. And the stunting levels in many African countries, including Namibia, is quite high. 
The latest statistic for Namibia is 24%, which frankly is uh, not quite acceptable. And therefore, government is forced to spend a lot of money educating such children because they spend twice the time in schools. Instead of spending seven years in primary school, they spend 15, 16 years because their cognitive abilities have been completely destroyed from birth. The second consequence uh, fits within, falls within the health sector. Such children, or most that are malnourished, including their mothers, have to visit health centers or facilities more times than others. And governments are forced to spend lots of money to sustain such cases. So it is a very strong advocacy tool that is driven by the African Union, supported by the World Food Program and other agencies. It uses a multi-sectoral approach to establish and portray to government what it would mean if hunger and nutrition was addressed at its infancy and how much resources and time would be saved by taking such action. Uh, this study is ongoing and um, it's being coordinated by the National Planning Commission in Namibia and um, it, uh, is it, it should come to an end in the next two or, or three months and will definitely pr be presented to the rightful um, audience and especially the decision makers in, in the coming months. The second study which is related to the COHA is called Fill the Nutrient Gap. This study tries to establish the gaps within nutrition with a focus on dietary diversity and the cost of diets. And it is also proven to be very useful for policy and strategic um, 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 uh, 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 direction for governments. By establishing these gaps, the study also proposes programs and recommendations on how such gaps can be addressed within countries. It's an ongoing study, also coordinated by the National Planning Commission, uh, the UN agencies, and uh, civil society and private sector. And um, again, it, it, it's envisaged to come to an end in the next um, two months. Um, the National Planning Commission envisages the outcome and recommendations from this study to contribute significantly to NDP6 and uh, other forthcoming um, strategic and policy um, discussions within the, within the country. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want us to have an interactive dialogue, but I think before we, we do that, I want to first, uh, first of all engage the, the panelists to just uh, ask them on, on, on questions emanating from their, from their presentations. But I think uh, with this, I think uh, Namibia is regarded as a model in promoting multilateralism, uh, as seen in its active participation in SADC, AU, and the UN, and other international platforms. Uh, I would want to, to ask the Honorable DPM, uh, how do you think this level of multilateralism can catalyze the response to food and nutri nutrition insecurity in Namibia? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, b before I answer, I want to ask Dr. Feder whether you are finished or you wanted your colleague to come in and then you conclude. Oh, okay. Mm, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, um, Namibia is uh, classified as um, an upper middle income. Uh, However, when you look at uh, all international instruments that uh, are addressing the issue of uh, food security and uh, also looking at the principle of the sustainable development goal, uh, which is also based on the principle of uh, no one should be left out. And uh, we strongly feel 
that uh, as much as that classification uh, has uh, given us a recognition of the progress we have made in terms of our developmental agenda, uh, we have not really reached a level that uh, we can be left on our own. So therefore, in uh, implementing these instruments, that are looking at um, ending hunger and uh, nobody should be left out. Uh, within the multilateralism setting and multilateralism cooperation and also at the bilateral level, we are looking at a situation whereby specific activities have to be addressed to address the specific target of uh, ending hunger. And uh, we feel that uh, for Namibia to be carried along in this program of ending hunger, and based also on the findings that are coming out from the multilateral research, uh, two of them we have just had, they are still to be concluded. And that is why we have to not just to focus on what has been agreed uh, by the, um, the World Bank, which looked at our population, the GDP, and multiply, but to look at things on the ground as they are coming out uh, from the statistics. And uh, we have also to, as uh, Honorable Kalo was talking, on uh, how we can talk about the value chain in terms of uh, food production. I, I was just reading a book, which was yesterday, uh, and I was reading a chapter on industrialization for development. And specifically, this book is also looking at identifying agriculture as uh, your goal. But then you have to bring in the issue of industrial development for ending poverty. Now, it is saying that, um, and I fully agree, that you have to look at the whole value chain. For example, if your target is agriculture, now what are the uh, in, uh, uh, instruments? What are the equipments? What are the, are the equipments that you need to boost up your agriculture? So therefore, you need then also to invest on agricultural uh, equipments so that you can increase your agriculture. So that is why if you look at some of the, 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 the international instruments that I have referred to, they are talking about international funding for enabling the agricultural production to be sustainable. So you need the equipments for your agriculture. So therefore, I just want to summarize to say, yes, we are in upper middle income, but in order to end hunger and to go by the sustainable development goals that no one should be left out, deliberate programs has to be developed for the upper middle income countries who are finding themselves in this situation that if they are not helped, if they are not being carried along by multilateral organization, definitely they are going to be left out and they will not be able to end hunger. I, I don't know, but uh, that's really what I feel in this situation in which uh, we find ourselves. Thank you, Honorable. Uh, DPM. Uh, the Honorable uh, Kalesh Letwain, uh, picking up from the DPM's contribution, uh, we are aware that uh, there are several programs under the Ministry of uh, Agriculture that have been designed to catalyze agriculture in Namibia. Most of these programs have experienced challenges over the years. What specifically do you think needs to be done differently to address these challenges and enable Namibia to reverse the decline in access in availability of food. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I um, think it's a very, very important question that asks, if I put it in other words, 
what do we need to change in our management model to bring about better food production at the agricultural level, but then also how do we link that production of raw material into value chains that it uh, produces more finished goods that are consumable. Now for the, for the public sector, I think where we have been not so strong is to develop management models that are based on targets of outcome, impact, whether it is production levels, whether it is hunger levels that are reduced, whether it is, is an, an um, GDP contribution increase or whatever. We have very few models that are structured along an output outcome based target. If you ask me what we need to do, that's where we must go. If I have an agricultural product or an agricultural research farm, that farm must have a business plan. That farm must tell me how much breeding stock, how much seeds they are developing, what is the outcome of it, and who is benefiting. And then they must go where, where, where you, Dr. Farah, came from. We must have the data to show, they must have the data to show that the impact is what we targeted to do. We haven't got that. The second point, I think, is we have, we have not well integrated the private and public activities in agriculture. We have taken the attitude that the private sector can help themselves, we help ourselves and the vulnerables, which is socially a very important aspect. But if you want to increase overall agricultural production, I think we must rope in the ability of the private sector to induce technology, financial means, um, efficiencies, so that we as government can say, our dividend is the social dividend. It is how people improve their livelihoods. We are not interested in profit. But we must allow the private sector to make that profit because that feeds our taxes, that feeds our financial means to, to do that. And I think we have not um, as yet come up with a an, with an model that integrates. That is our task. That is what Harambe 2 will do. That is what Harambe 1 actually tried to do, that we, that we open up to the, to the private sector more, uh, rope them in, and then lastly, to talk about multilateralism, yes, the instruments that we develop in SADC, the instruments that we develop in the AU, must help us. We must uh, develop a capacity in food production, in agricultural production, agricultural equipment, whatever, so that we can optimally use the SADC trade protocol, the continental-wide free trade arrangement. If we do not produce beef, grapes, tractors, seed, vaccines, fertilizers for the African market, someone else will. And that opportunity will be lost for us. So we have to gear ourselves in the production lines, in the production, in the development of value chains together with the private sector that we, that we meaningful utilize the, the um, opportunities that are being given through these trade protocols that we have, through these bilateral and multilateral instruments that we have. And lastly, I think that is a matter that, that is, is, is equally important. We must utilize our knowledge, our database, our um, needs in such a way that we have influence in the global rulemaking, in global governance issues, so that we can say as a collective or as an individual, our needs in availability of intellectual property is this. 
the rules must allow it or must prevent it if it is not possible. We have intellectual property, but it is poorly recorded, it is not registered, we are deprived from using it when it is taken by someone else and, and, and registered. So we must utilize our membership, our existence in multilateral bodies to participate actively in rulemaking and in governance issues. Only then can multilateral um, provisions be helpful us, for us. We should be part and parcel of the rulemaking and then we should be part and parcel of the compliance to those rules. But they should not be selectively used or disregarded. So those three elements are the ones that I would propose. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable uh, Minister. Uh, talking about uh, global governance, that leads me to Dr. Feather's uh, question. Uh, Dr. Feather, uh, in, in this uh, conversation, the WFP is a food systems actor. Uh, how, how dependent is your organization in decision making uh, of other actors in the system to play your role to address food nutrition insecurity? Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Yeah, um, I think I'll borrow from uh, Excellency's uh, initial uh, presentation about uh, the work that is going on, the multilateral engagement with the African Union, NEPAD, and we are riding on that also to do the studies that we are doing. Uh, and then what uh, Honorable Kale said also is around uh, what, what is it that needs to be done to improve the existing programs. Uh, so for WFP, uh, it tags onto these two and broader, broader arrangements to take it down to the ground to also engage in kind of futuristic partnerships because we engage in partnerships that provide value to WFP based on what the government vision is and what the global SDG uh, components are. So what is the example of futuristic partnerships? So if, if the World Food Program is going to work with the rest of the UN to do programs that address nutrition outcomes, do we want to engage with a partner who does not believe in climate adaptation? The answer is no. So we have to also start being selective in the kind of partner, partnerships we are, we are going to engage with. So the issue of uh, targeted partnerships uh, is going to be a very key thing for us in order to be able to make the decisions that we need to make along with our partners. Um, the other area is the support to smallholder agriculture. There's a lot of market access issues, which again we are being involved in as we have, uh, we have recently received contributions from Brazil, from the European Union, from the US and other partners and Japan. Uh, most of these contributions are not only addressing food and nutrition security, but also addressing how to stimulate local economy through these investments. For every dollar that goes into the community, there should be about $1.5 coming out. I'll give you an example. Uh, if, say, you are going to do a voucher program in Kunene in the next few months, we are going to be engaging retailers local retailers to be the ones dispensing the vouchers to those who are coming to redeem their vouchers. That means this retailer's capacity to sell more will be increased. So how do we do those programs gradually to stimulate the local economy? Because the retailer sells more, that means the local farmer will also produce more for this retailer. So these are the practical things that we are trying to roll down, but again, Back to your question, how do we make those decisions? Again, there has to be a study. We have to study the market to ensure that, you know, we are not forcing retailers to sell uh, ice cream and they don't have a fridge, for example. Uh, so we have to engage retailers in selling produce that they can be capable of selling. We have to engage the regional governor, uh, the agriculture officers at the, at the region, the health uh, colleagues to make sure that the nutrition values of these foods are, are maintained. So. Uh, we have a lot of networking to do. Um, the other area that I think I have put a note somewhere here is around, again borrowing from uh, uh, Honorable Kyle, is around value chain. Uh, traditionally, 
uh, we, we were most focused on production and consumption. But now, with the localized way of improving production, diversifying, intensifying, I can continue to borrow those words, how, how do we start to engage the local health centers that have been giving ready-to-use supplementary feeding, some of which was donated by Brazil last year, now that we are past that stage, they can use the local mahangu mixed with other components to produce similarly, equally nutritious foods. So we are also gradually encouraging that kind of enterprise among women, and the decisions also around that are being made with, the, of course, the health experts to ensure that food is safe, and also the, the, we are focusing on the women entrepreneurs. So a lot of decisions that need to in, in, include a wide section of partners that will be involved. And finally, um, the diversified diets. We have a lot of information in Namibia about which regions are the biggest consumers of beef, for example. Uh, I remember an example when I was, uh, when I was again touring Namibia and uh, and at, at one point, I, I almost stopped eating meat because I had eaten too much meat. But I ended up in Gobabis, and the restaurant owner told me, you're making a big mistake because this is the worst place to stop eating meat because you have, <laughs> you have the best meat. So uh, again, how do we start engaging uh, people like me to, to, to diversify our diet, to start going into crop, uh, not just consumption, but also growing crops. Now, we have seen, again, as Her Excellency said, COVID has taught us a lesson. It's not only us sitting in, in, in Windhoek. When you go out there, there are so many farmers who lost livestock. Uh, we were in, in, in Berseba a couple of months ago, and we have continued to follow this community. Areas that they lost stock of sheep, they have gradually transformed it into growing vegetables, spinach, beetroot, and carrots. So these are, again, are things that we can encourage and support, and I think those are the kind of programs and decisions we are taking. So I'll stop there for you. Thank you, Thank you Doctor. Um, having mentioned uh, the challenges of COVID, it, indeed it's, a, it, it's one of the contemporary challenges that is um, posing a challenge to food security. I wanted to pose the following question to the Honorable uh, uh, DPM. Uh, the extent of the challenge facing food security and food systems requires an urgent need for collective action, which has been highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has revealed extreme inequities and alarming fragilities in today's food systems. What are some of the multilateral solutions that can contribute to addressing this challenge? Yes. Um, uh, first, is uh, it was already mentioned here that uh, when you are addressing a challenge it was mentioned by comrade kali when you are addressing the challenge you cannot just rely on yourself and specifically he referred to the world brain which is available so we know that uh, at the multilateral level, there is quite a number of research which has been done with particular reference on how to deal with disasters. And uh, what we experience with COVID is a disaster that came as a, a result of that uh, COVID pandemic. So what is really needed is a, a closer open collaboration uh, within multilateral bodies as well as at the bilateral level, uh, whereby countries and organizations can exchange experience, uh, whereby uh, good lessons can be exchanged, thus enabling individual member states to see how best 
they can bring that to their own situation. Yes, multilateral is what is going to help us to have all this knowledge. But from the COVID experience, and not knowing when, in what form, or what form the next disaster will take, is quite necessary for empower, local empowerment to be developed. Why I'm saying this? When COVID-19 was announced, the immediate natural reaction, every country closed their borders. Now, which means every country was left on its own for those days, either they are two days, five days, they was completely locked down of the whole world. So that's why this is the time for each country to see how do I survive for two, five days if the whole world is, a clo is closed to me. And these multilateral instruments that are put on, they are now meant to assist the member states to prepare for that. So that's how really it can be used. When you are still able to link up with one another, see where you need. Is it uh, uh, technical assistance? Is it financial assistance? Uh, so that when that time comes, then at least the world population, wherever they will find themselves, they will be saved. In any case, you don't know whether where your nationals will be found when the whole world will be closed. We know some citizens were locked up in their foreign countries, but uh, those specific governments have to take care of them. So that is really how I feel in a time when we can all interact, we need to do serious, serious cross-fertilization of ideas. We have to do a serious support of programs and that's why when you ask the first question on a country like Namibia, in the situation where we found ourselves and others who are classified as upper middle income, they are not in a position whereby they can make themselves ready in case of another disaster that might even be higher or bigger than the COVID-19. So collaboration is to be done now very openly and then to the benefit of all so that no one should be left out. Thank you, Thank you Honorable DPM. I think um, our time, uh, we have about 12 minutes left. I would want to have an interaction uh, dialogue as I indicated at the beginning. I want to open the discussion for, for the floor if uh, uh, the audience have questions or comments to make. I see a hand behind you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Motorado. All protocol observed. I must commend the organizers of this event uh, for such a very important topic, a topic that is very much close to my heart, which is food security related to production. Many issues have been, been mentioned uh, but I think there's one thing, we talk about production. For production, you need land, you need arable land to produce your food, for food sufficiency and food security. The current resettlement program that the Ministry of Agriculture is, is, is running, or the Ministry of Land Reform is running, uh, seem to be more pro-livestock. Uh, the Honorable Minister has also mentioned that um, Harmful agricultural practices um, can have negative impacts for production. Livestock farming can contribute to that. The, the drought of the past, uh, past couple of years has taught us a very serious lesson that has contributed to food, food insecurity. The resettlement program that I'm referring to is pro-livestock, meaning that it discriminates uh, towards those that are more interested in crop farming. 
because the criteria, the current criteria for you to acquire land or to get access to a resettlement farm, you must have livestock. You must prove that you own livestock. That's one of the criteria. You must give the number of livestock that you own. And you must prove from the uh, ministry, provide evidence that you own livestock. So the, the, the criteria is, is, is more livestock. While we are now talking about food security for, 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 for production. So in that sense, uh, I believe there must be serious consideration of reviewing the criteria so that people who only are interested in crop farming can access these farms. And not only um, are people who own livestock to access these farms, uh, because now we have to review the criteria so that people can access this land. So maybe that's, that's one thing that the minister must honestly consider, because it's too, it's too pro-livestock, um, the current criteria. And, and, and as a result, many people that really are interested in crop farming cannot access these farms. The other issue um, with regard to access to land, obviously, as it has been mentioned, uh, there is urbanization taking place. The farm that we visited yesterday um, is close to Windhoek, just five kilometers outside Havana, uh, outside Karatura. Already one could see that there is expansion. There was infrastructure development currently taking place, meaning that within two years' time, the, 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 this, the, the population of, of, of Karatura might reach that farm. Uh, and that means that there is encroachment taking place because of urbanization on arable agricultural land. Towns like uh, uh, um, Oshakati, Ungwediva, and so on, we have seen that many surrounding um, uh, crop farmers' lands have already been in, in, encroached. So uh, it means that it takes up land that is needed for production. People were busy uh, uh, planting mahango and so on. Now the towns and cities are expanding, and it takes up crop land. As a result, those very households are now food insecure. So maybe that's one thing that we need to, to, to take note of. Uh, in the context of production and food security, the, the expansion of towns and cities that are taking up arable land. Also, that contributes to uh, human wildlife conflict uh, in the sense that um, that uh, um, is now, land is taken up and it becomes closer to why wildlife is free roaming and as a result, there is wildlife uh, conflict. So these are all issues that um, deals with food insecurity because now the elephants are coming closer to the crop fields and destroy people's mahongo fields. So that's how why I'm saying urbanization also contributes to food insecurity in the sense that we're taking up arable agriculture land. So these are issues that we need to maybe consider. My name is Olaf Munjano. I'm associated with the World Food Program. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. I saw another hand behind here. Can give it in front here. Thank you so much, Director of Ceremonies. I am the Indian High Commissioner here, uh, Honorable Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Honorable Agriculture Minister, uh, Honorable Deputy Minister for Mirko, Madam Guriras, Mr. Feda, uh, senior officials. All protocol observed. Uh, let me first of all thank uh, Mirko for organizing this discussion on a topical of vital importance. Uh, we have all spent past one year fighting COVID, and we have seen that the first and uh, foremost impact of uh, the economic challenges posed by COVID-19 has been the difficulties people face in, in, in accessing food. So it, it's a question of equally vital importance. Uh, Honorable Deputy Prime Minister very rightly referred to the need for foreign policy to be involved in agriculture, and she also mentioned about uh, need for collaboration. Uh, Honorable uh, Agriculture Minister talked about uh, need to bring the global power, global brains together, and I think these are the, the cornerstones of uh, multilateralism. So let me very briefly just mention on two positive notes uh, coming on the, on the multilateral front. One is this very new and novel initiative uh, for which our delegations and our governments work together in New York to declare 2023 as the year of millets. So this is a very new initiative uh, and uh, millet, uh, Mahangu is a, is a very dear and essential crop uh, providing nutrition to millions of people 
in our countries but across the world. So we hope that in next two years we will have some very meaningful uh, projects and activities to undertake to give uh, millets their rightful place uh, in our food chain. The second welcome positive note is, uh, uh, of course, the, the new African leadership taking over uh, in WTO with Madame Gozi from Nigeria taking over as the new WTO G DG. Uh, now, if I may submit humbly that uh, the, the WTO agreement on agriculture is one which perhaps has suffered from some democratic deficit and also some commercial real politicking. And uh, uh, I think there, are, there have been uh, a very uh, sort of you know, fine balancing uh, need to balance the questions of market access and subsidies, particularly domestic subsidies on one hand, and uh, uh, on the other hand, ensuring food and nutritional security and farmers' welfare on the other hand. And I think that challenge has been particularly acute for developing countries like us, where these are essentially livelihood issues for a very large number of farmers. I mean, back home we have a very lively debate on that. So we really are very hopeful and we are very happy and very confident that the African leadership at WTO will, will give new directions to these burning issues. And lastly, to conclude, um, Honorable Deputy Prime Minister, we, we heard very clearly your directions on, on the need for on-the-ground implementation and supervision. Uh, uh, just to mention very briefly that, among others, uh, we are also working under the guidance of uh, the esteemed Agriculture Ministry with local communities to, to have a large-scale cultivation of jojoba crop, which is a very well-suited crop for arid areas. And this is being uh, done in, 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 in the Erongo region. So we have to have very valuable on the ground guidance of the two ministers for that project. Thank you so much once again for this lovely discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. You brought in a very important uh, aspect of that of the WTO, uh, because I think uh, agricultural subsidies is one of the topics under discussion at the WTO. And it's, it's, it's a very sensitive area indeed. Uh, I think. Uh, I can allow two more, two more speakers. There's another speaker there to just be brief. Just at the end of the line there. Uh, thank you, dear moderator. Thank you, panelists, who, for a very lovely presentation. Um, all, all protocols observed. My name is Ruko van der Merve. I'm a uh, food security advisor with the U.S. Embassy. Um, I think I'd like to just start by saying that as the largest global donor to the World Food Program, I can confidently say that the U.S. is committed to eradicating food insecurity, ending hunger, and a key part, the keyest part of that, we believe to be multilateralism. Um, President Biden recently noted that the challenges we face will only be solved by nations working together and in common. We can't do it alone. And I think this is a very great platform for us to move to that, that discussion forward. The world is facing unprecedented challenges, COVID, conflict, climate. Uh, it's, it's real big challenges that we're facing at a global level and multilateralism is a key to help overcome some of those challenges. Um, I really appreciated the points around kind of the role of agricultural production in achieving food security. I guess my, my comment or my question is more in regards to what about the other dimensions, um, such as economic development, um, improving off-farm livelihoods or non-farm livelihoods, because those as well play a key role in generating income for households, which can also then help them access food and achieve food security. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Before I, I give the, the, the next, um, for the next question, I just got a comment here. They came in from social media. This is from uh, David Kulunga. He comments on our Facebook page. He's saying that uh, the Ministry of Agriculture should change the policies around importation of locally produced produce. And all agricultural investors should be clearly identified. The other comment on, uh, on Twitter is uh, Oliver Muriro. He's saying... Uh, Multilateralism in agricultural sector is facilitated and accelerated with a hashtag integration and more effort in working together 
hashtag multilateralism is the way forward in security, hashtag food security, through increasing investment in the agricultural sector. Uh, let me give uh, another, okay, Biande. Uh, thank you very much um, for the opportunity. Uh, I'll send on the protocol already established. Uh, a lot of things have been mentioned. Uh, however, uh, water has not been mentioned because um, for food security, we need water. Crops need water, livestock need water. Um, fresh water currently is becoming a rare commodity on Earth. And uh, on our continent, we already see a few tensions in uh, North Africa between Egypt and uh, Ethiopia regarding the um, Great Renaissance Dam. So what can be done to avoid um, such uh, conflicts which may arise from water conflicts to, in, to, uh, to a certain that we are, we are using the water for the food production? Uh, secondly, um, I, I would like to, to thank uh, Honorable Kale Schladwein for mentioning the Africa Free Trade uh, Agreement. Uh, I would like to know um, what does it mean to Namibian farmers and uh, what programs has the government put in place to ready the farmers to ensure that uh, we benefit from such a great uh, initiative. Thank you. Thank you. I have one in the middle here. Thank you, moderator. All protocol observe. My question is to Dr. Feder. Where do we go from here? How does the World Food Program and its stakeholders utilize the multilateral environment created to fast track the journey towards zero hunger in Namibia? Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, what we are going to do now uh, because of time, we are going to give uh, uh, each panelist, uh, the, the, of course, the closing remarks in, uh, and also in response to the questions that have been posed and the comments that have been made uh, on social media. Uh, can we perhaps start uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Feather? Oh, okay. No, thank you, and, and thank you, uh, colleagues, and thank you, uh, Beta, for the question. I think because of time, I'll just quickly go through. Um, number one is the, like I said, futuristic partnerships is a solution that also includes partnerships in water provision. So uh, um, the question around water will need to bring in a lot of uh, innovation, uh, and then also uh, experts in the water section, which I think we are not many of us in the water section here, but we need to bring in those people on board. Uh, where do we go from here also includes, for example, when some of us work with the smallholder farmers, we will need also to categorize these smallholder farmers. Is Do we invest in smallholder farmers that are on the threshold of falling below a livelihood level? or do we invest in smallholder farmers who are able to become productive quickly? So we need to make these decisions, and these are things that will also be helped by the studies that are ongoing. Um, and then, as we go out, uh, we are happy uh, to learn from the 2023 year of, uh, of millet. So uh, this is an encouraging thing of investing in new, new uh, kind of uh, emerging nutrition, nutritious crops um, yesterday I met a, a very amazing enterprising lady from Omaheke called Ms. Onomengi and she's trying to make fortified food from Mahangu and some of it is very tasty, I tested some of it has got some uh, cinnamon inside Mahangu and some honey so I will encourage you to make this connection so again as my colleague from IFAO said we need to move from rhetoric to action so when we see uh, enterprising people like uh, Ms. Onamengi, how do we quickly promote that without all these bureaucracies that usually stop us from supporting such enterprising people? Again, articulating clear results and evidence, uh, again, as, as Honorable Kale said, to bring efficiency into some of the programs that are under the Minister of Agriculture. Uh, how do we ensure that subsistence livelihoods are lifted but also climate adaptation is encouraged uh, as well as uh, 
looking at productivity, not just in terms of production, but also into the value chain uh, side of things. Um, the South-South cooperation is another area that we, we need to encourage, and I think we already have success models in Rwanda, in my small villages in Kenya. We can, we can have exchange visits and exchange information. We don't have to physically visit their online platforms these days to encourage farmers to grow. For example, uh, I am aware that on the 22nd of April, a group of farmers in Katima are going to do a market day because as a way to deal with their problem of accessing markets, to so call people in and come and see what we grow. So how do we support that kind of group? And they're actually in a network of other countries, uh, similar uh, activities going on. So it's nice to see South-South cooperation is not just between us here, but also those groups sitting in Katima working with groups are sitting in Zambia and Zimbabwe. So how do we also encourage that growth of those uh, groups? Uh, the, in, in the last few months, every time we've gone to the field, we've had comments around community development projects not being successful. A lot of people would say, you know, these projects sometimes mostly fail because there's no commitment from community groups. And in most cases, it's true. However, when we have seen the successes around schools and health center-based programs, those are the projects that maybe we should also give more focus. And so the homegrown school feeding, uh, and thanks Excellency for mentioning that, is a way to make a local production, uh, local trading, in, 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 increase local retailer engagement, and as somebody, as, as Ruko mentioned also, on-farm and off-farm, you know, employment for the youth. So these are things that we can actually hinge on, on, a, on a homegrown school feeding program. Um, and lastly, also is to scale up support to women and youth so that whatever programs are usually placed to encourage the community, we subsidize or we give incentives to women and youth to participate in these programs. We've seen during COVID, this is a group that actually brings a lot of value in facilitating better solutions for the country. So that's all I can say for now. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, may I please give the floor to Honorable uh, Kalesh Letwan, Minister of Agriculture. Okay, thank you very much. I try to go through these seven questions very quickly. All of them were very uh, interesting and raising important points. The first one um, from the colleague from the World Food Program, drought uh, creating in uh, food insecurity. Well, I, I um, want to make the statement that our agricultural systems offer very, very little resilience to drought. They are in silos. And that is also reflecting in your, in your statement of the criteria for resettlement. We still have an agricultural system that is, in my mind, pretty outdated, which says, if you are a livestock farmer, you are a livestock farmer. If you are a crop producer, you are a crop producer. And you are treated differently to, to others. Now, have a look at the last drought. We lost half of our cattle herd, one year or three years drought, say, lost half of our national herd. That is too much. You cannot say it's a good system when the risk of drought, which are frequently occurring, has such a drastic impact on that sector. So we must build more resilience into the agricultural system. And what we believe uh, we should do, and I think it was mentioned here by, by, by you, Doctor, we will have to diversify, so you must have more activities on your piece of land than only one, but then you must also um, horizontally integrate, because if you have fuller production on your farm where you breed cows, you can, you can mitigate against drought. That's a very simpl simplistic way of saying it. But we have green schemes. And because of the silo approach, we say you are only producing maize and wheat, no lucerne, no food production, for, no 
annual food production. So if we integrate better, we will improve our resilience and with that mitigate against drought. So, and then ultimately against food insecurity in, in, in the agricultural system. So I think you, you, you touched on a very important point. Resettlement being pro-livestock, yes, on face, face value that is true. But I can also inform you that we have a green scheme program where each green scheme of, of the 12 that we have have a group of small scale farmers that are resettled onto the re green scheme. It's not part of the resettlement scheme in commercial agriculture. There's more an, an program in the communal area where we develop crop producing um, ability for small scale farmers on green schemes, but also on a development program where we look at um, putting infrastructure on communal land that is underdeveloped. So we create water points, we create um, irrigation facilities where water is available. Lastly, we, are, we have agreed to that in principle and we are changing the criteria for resettlement that it includes a diversified range of activities on that farm. But it must be tailor-made to that piece of land. Um, so, point is taken. Urbanization, well, it's a difficult one. The competition for land will grow. And agricultural land being the most land use in the, in the country will be on the receiving end. We will develop more and more cities and more and more industries on what has up to now been agricultural land. So the, 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 the point of uh, intensifying agricultural production on a smaller space of land surface is, is the case in point here. That is what we have to do. I think we cannot keep industrial development hostage because of the argument that we want to perpetuate extensive farming practices that use vast quantity of land. It's not affordable, it's not, not feasible and sustainable anymore, so we have to um, deal with it by changing farming practices, moving more to intensive farming. Hi, Commissioner, thank you very much. We have been consuming your minute. We have tried to grow it, not successful, because of um, the genetic um, qualities or abilities of, of your millet. It, is, it has a bit bigger cone, but it doesn't do well in our, in our environment. So I'm very happy to hear that we, we are cooperating in that area to, to improve the yields of, of bahango or millet in our circumstances. That's a very important thing because millet forms a very, very important component of the staples in, in Namibia. It is part of the um, regulated um, corn. So yes, improvement in yields is, is crucial. That's one of the drawbacks of, of, of Mahango. Yields are, are pretty low. And there's a need to, to improve that. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. Your comment on the balance between livelihood necessities and economic opportunities in, in the trade agenda is, is absolutely pivotal. And that's where we, that we, that's where we are struggling in the um, trade agenda. You, you, you will remember that at the meeting in, in um, Indonesia on, of the trade ministers, that was the key topic that we, we especially the African countries and developing countries were, were pushed into a situation where we had to give up opportunities for livelihood necessities of a number of very vulnerable farmers for the sake of increasing the economic opportunities for the wealthy countries. I, I think that was an, 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 um, a sad day when we had to abandon that um, that need, or we, we, we didn't abandon, we were, we were overruled, or over, over the interests were. We hope that it will come back. I think the whole discussion on 
agricultural subsidies is is uh, needs to be reopened. Now, if you mm -hmm. take the discussion on on, for instance, cotton, that that some Western countries pay more subsidies to a unit of cotton than the proceeds of an agricultural of, of a farmer in West Africa is for that for that cotton. It's it's terrible skewness to the disadvantage of the African farmer. So, so that that must be um, a priority of the WTO to to correct. And I agree with you that therefore we should cooperate. And that that is what multilateral, multilateralism um, is there for. That these small groups where their livelihood is at stake has a voice in the world's decision-making and rule-making. If multilateralism would not be there, they would be never heard. And I think that is, that is the, the, the point that you also mentioned, Gilbert, Deputy Prime Minister. Multilateralism affords us a platform where everyone is heard. Everyone's argument can be considered. And the best solution for everyone is then taken. So that, that would be in the ideal situation what multilateralism can offer. We are very happy to hear from um, the USA that multilateralism is important. Yeah, that, that is very, very good news. I think we all agree that that um, is in fact what we should strive at. You are right, there are other incoming generating activities that can supplement or replace um, agricultural activities once you are fully industrialized or on your road to industrialization. I didn't elaborate in all those possibilities. Very broad topic, but in principle, yes, of course, it is, it is agreed that that um, is an ultimate consequence of the division of labor so that your livelihoods can be generated from, from many activities. Then there is a question from, um, from a listener from outside to change import rules for agricultural produce. Well, if you change for the sake of protecting, that's one, one policy, policy decision that you can take. If you change for the sake of openness, that's another approach you take. When you embrace multilateralism, it is the letter that you embrace. You open up. And, and, and the reason for that necessity um, is the following, and I want to use an example. Namibia produces a lot of beef. We can only consume 30% of it. We are too few to eat all the cows that we produce, if I put it bluntly. So 70% of that production must be exported. Now, if you don't have access to the export market, you are in big trouble. You can't utilize that production, it goes to waste. And with the proceeds of that production, you can import some necessities that you have, for instance, uh, well, things that you don't produce. Is it medicines? Is it agricultural equipment? Is it cars? Is it whatever? Oil. You don't have oil, so you must import it. And, and, and we believe that um, multilateralism is important to create a fair set of rules that allows you access into foreign markets and assures a fair reward for that export. And then again, vice versa, if you import, you are not done in or, or on the, at the short end. Having said that, I, I do, of course, agree that when it comes to what the Indian High Commissioner has indicated, those activities where livelihood necessities are threatened because of a trade arrangement multilaterally, the sovereign must step in and protect those, those groups and make it possible that their livelihood is still improved and protected. So there are national interests that are, of course, 
a very important. And, and in Namibia, we are doing it. We have a regulation of some cereals that we believe are basic cereals are under a regulated scheme. Prices regulated, imported exports are regulated so that we assure that those cereals that we consider staples are utilized in the country and that we do not lose the productive capacity that we have. So it's an it's an trade-off that we have to go in, but it is an important question. I also agree with the statement that multilateralism is supporting investment. We have identified agriculture as a priority, and it then goes without saying that investments in agriculture are considered to be an and priority. If you, and it's coming back to the comment that we should not, that we should go beyond rhetoric. Yes, if we, if we have identified agriculture as a priority, invest in it. It will be favored if someone invests in agriculture than in other activities because of its status as a priority. And it's, it's, it's a, a very valid statement that multilateralism is supporting investment in agriculture. I think there is a general realization that food security, food self-sufficiency, um, food supply chains, food value chains must be always a priority area. The colleague who mentioned water, yes, I wanted to mention water. Of course, it's very much the same as food. It's probably even more important because you can stay longer without food than without water. But I didn't want to derail the discussion into a water debate. It, it, it is probably a topic of another, another session, but it is at least equally important. So I, I agree fully with you. And lastly, um, what are the benefits for, of the CFTA for farmers? Well, I, I believe the, 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 the benefit for farmers are they can now ready themselves to produce for the export market, which is sometimes better paying than domestic markets. Again, the beef is an, is an example. We, we are producing high quality beef. If you sell it domestically to as farmer to, to an abattoir, at the moment you get what? 57 dollars a kilogram. That same beef, if it is just slaughtered and deboned, fetches 350 dollars in the European market. So the, the farmer has now an opportunity to produce for a better paying market while satisfying the domestic market equally. It's true for crop production. Also, you can have a, a diversified crop production or rotation um, system where you produce cereals for the domestic market, but you beef it up with producing grapes or man mangoes or, or berries or asparagus, which gives a far higher yield per hectare, but where there is very little demand in the domestic market, but there is a big demand in the um, export market. Multilateral trade agreements give you access to that better paying market and with that you have a chance to increase your your livelihood. There's of course the down that some farmers in the countries where you sell to may also sell in your market. So you are exposed to that competition now and that's where subsidies come in. You know, if, if if subsidies are given to those farmers but not to you, the competition, the level of the flame field is not level anymore and you are, you are struggling. But that is, that is the, the benefit in the CFTA. Um, I think there are the, the, the matter of subsidies is, is, is not that um, risky because of the rule of origin regime that the CFTA have. You, you, you cannot um, accumulate with um, subsidized goods, so the competition and the playing field is more level. Yes, I think that was that was the question, and thank you. Uh, let me give the floor to the Honorable DPM uh, for your closing remarks before we come to the uh, vote of thanks. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Uh, this is really going to be a closing remark because uh, the other panelists have touched on the issues that were raised on the floor. And uh, I fully agree with uh, what they have contributed or respond to those issues. And our program is having a, a program on the vote of thanks. Uh, what, what really came out and uh, I think is reinforcing what we know is that uh, global village is real and uh, multilateralism is the instrument that we have to use as citizens of the global village uh, in order to let what is being done at the multilateral level to be felt on the ground down up to the rural communities of the world citizen. And uh, when it comes to agriculture, which is uh, the subject matter, uh, definitely uh, every human being is a consumer of agricultural product. And that is why it is very central in our global village. And what has come out is that uh, it requires collaboration at all levels. Uh, collaborate at the government level, collaborate at um, international organization level, and even bring it to the collaboration at the community level from one country to another. And uh, even in the country itself, there could be a collaboration from one village to another or from one region to another so that the people can learn from one another as to what is happening in order for really agriculture to uh, deliver what is uh, expected. Uh, we are talking about agriculture when you have identified, as we have identified it in Namibia, that is a priority. You make it your focus of your industry. And you have to look holistically on everything that is required in order to reinforce agriculture. Water has been mentioned. Fertilizers can be mentioned. Education and training has to come in. Technology has to come in. Agricultural implements have to come in. Transport, marketing. And therefore, within the multilateralism, when we talk about trade and investment, you want to focus on investment that you know that will have an impact on agriculture because that is your priority. It does not mean you cannot look at other sectors. But this, at the center of your planning, you cannot at any point to ignore the agriculture because that is your focus. And uh, that is really what we are going to drive as a government, having decided to make agriculture as a priority. We know that you have also to look at health because you need health bodies in order to drive your agriculture. You have to look at education because you need to train your people. Similarly, you have also to understand your level where you are because agriculture is also at stages. You have small-scale agriculture. Are you at the level where you can now focus on the middle agricultural production or are you at the level where you are focusing on large-scale production? But in Namibia, we have a mix. So that is why we value both supporting the small scale uh, uh, agricultural producers, middle and large. And all of them, they have different needs. However, the final target is to really uh, make the whole agricultural production in Namibia as a big industry in order to cater for our country. And that's why my friend there, the minister has responded about the form. If that form has not changed, it has to change. 
At one point, I was assigned by a cabinet, and Comrade Kale was a member of my committee. And that committee was looking at uh, land and related matters. Issues were discussed in the cabinet, decisions were taken, and then a cabinet committee to look on how those decisions can be implemented was set up. And I was uh, given a responsibility to chair that committee. So the issue of resettlement, Focusing on livestock was discussed, and it was decided that we now have to diversify the resettlement program. So therefore, if we have not changed the form, it should change. As the minister said, we, we are not looking to that a decision is taken, that it has to change. And when we are resettling, you are going to see, is this land good for livestock? Is this land good for mix? Is this land is for crop production? Is this one is for tourism? Anything that you can use on land, we are going to look at it so that we can resettle people appropriately in order for those resettled farms to be productive. So that's already a decision. It just needs to be implemented. So this is really how we see it. And uh, I still say I'm very grateful for the multilateralism bodies and the bilaterals who are involved in uh, agricultural related activities. It could be maybe you have some who want to invest on fertilizers or looking into f uh, tractors or whatever we need. These are the things we look at. And these are the things that I would want to be getting my reports and see what is really happening on the ground. I agree, rhetoric has been too long. And people of Namibia, people of Africa, they can no longer wait. I think with the COVID, nothing comes uh, without advantage and disadvantage. The disadvantage is the way it has put us. By the advantage is thing to teach us to do things differently. And I think we have a reason to do that. So that is really how I conclude, and I say you have enriched this discussion, and uh, we must take them forward. And I'm really happy that we all agree that uh, there should be no rhetoric. People are getting tired, and uh, even ourselves who are talking, we need really to have concrete action that can make a difference in the lives of our people. I'm done. Let's give our... Panelists, end of applause. Thank you. Uh, as indicated earlier, my responsibility was only to moderate. I'm now going to call upon our Deputy Minister, Honorable General Lee Matundu, to come and give a, hand of a, uh, a vote of thanks, which is to be followed by the, by the singing of the AU and National Anthem. Honorable Nandi Daitwa, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of International Relations and Cooperation. Honorable Schledwein, Minister of Agriculture, Water and Land Reform. Dr. Feder, Country Representative of the United Nation, Nations World Food Program. The Dean of Diplomatic Corps, Your Excellency Wagiba, members of the diplomatic community present, moderator and uh, the director of ceremony, Ambassador Penda Nanda, the executive director of Mirko, Mrs. Joan Guriras, the organizing committee of the Dr. Theoben Gurira lecture series, Mirko staff, members of the media, distinguished invited guests, social media audience, ladies and gentlemen. I wish to extend my honor to Honorable Nandi Ndaitwa, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister, for welcoming, for your welcoming remarks. My thanks also goes to our moderator and director of ceremony, Ambassador Penda Nanda, for exceptionally moderating this lecture, 
held under the new normal as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic. On behalf of the Ministry of International Relations and Cooperation, I wish to use this opportunity to thank our distinguished panelists for making time from their busy schedules to be part of this 10th Dr. Theoben Grirab lecture series on the theme, How Can Multilateralism Improve Food Security? for their valuable contribution towards the discussions. Furthermore, your brilliant presentations and well thoughts, thought out analysis of the topic, explaining the various programs and initiatives that Namibia has put in place to address food security are highly appreciated. The lecture also enlightened the audience on the importance of the role of multilateralism in addressing food security, especially through the enhancement of human capital development. Furthermore, the discussions look at challenges and gaps that still exist for Namibia to address food security. It is in this regard we thank our bilateral and multilateral partners in working closely with the Namibian government to ensure the successful implementation of the country's zero hunger roadmap. In conclusion, we express our sincere gratitude to all our social media audience who participated and follow this lecture series on our different visual platforms such as Facebook Live and other social platforms through which it was being broadcasted. Your contribution to the discussion of this important theme made the lecture series a memorable one for us. Moreover, I would like to thank the Mirko staff under the guidance of the heads of departments and directorates. The, the Dr. Theo Ben Grirap committee as for their hard work and teamwork to make the 10th Dr. Theo Ben Grirap lecture series a huge success. Finally, I would like to thank you all mostly for participating in this lecture and I wish you all the best and be safe. Let's all adhere to the COVID uh, protocols so that we can stay safe. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable. Uh, may we raise for the AU and National Anthem. And before, before that, I would just want to remind everyone we have questionnaires on the tables to just please uh, complete those questionnaires. They assist us in uh, improving the, 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 the lecture series. I thank you. Let us all unite and celebrate together the victories of our liberation. ourselves to rise together, to defend our liberty and unity. O sons and daughters of Africa, flesh of the sun and flesh of the star, let us make